these introductions since the inception of the Institute of Politics, but this is a special welcome to an old friend um, who was quite a young friend when I met her uh, years ago when she was first uh, uh, an aide in the White House uh, to the First Lady. Uh, we have um, been in many ventures together. We've been in campaigns together. We were in one campaign where we weren't together, but uh, I can tell you that whether, whatever side, <coughs> whatever side, uh, sides we were on, uh, Huma has been a very consistent person, kind, thoughtful, smart, passionate about public service, passionate about this country, passionate about helping people, and really a role model, uh, not just to some, but to everyone who aspires to uh, to, to uh, helping, to being part of pu this public, uh, of public service, to making an impact in the public square. Uh, she is someone we can all look up to. So we welcome her uh, today, and it's a thrill to see her uh, as she talks about her, her new book. Um, now I can return to the mundane business of, uh, of upcoming events, uh, none of which are mundane. Uh, uh, on Wednesday, uh, I will be in conversation with Mark Short, uh, who served as Chief of Staff for Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, on Thursday, uh, Governor Chris Christie, former Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey will be here and will be in conversation about his new book, Republican Rescue, a playbook for Republicans to win the White House and take back Congress. It seems like there's some clues in there about his own plans, but I don't know, we'll ask him. <laughs> uh, both events will be uh, recorded uh, for uh, the Axe Files podcast, but uh, there'll also be a Q&A uh, session after each and encourage you to come. And then on, on Friday, we'll host a panel discussion regarding the rising role of the Asian American community in our nation's uh, politics, an appropriate way to end this week. Um, uh, as always, we'll have uh, questions here today. Uh, our splendid IOP executive director, Zenat Rahman, uh, also a former colleague of Humans at, Humans at the State Department, uh, will uh, lead the discussion. And then we'll take questions from you in the audience. Please line up at the microphones that will be at either side of the stage to ask your question. And remember, uh, Actually, we, we've lost that. We used to say this all the time. Uh, remember that questions uh, end in a question mark. Uh, and as usual, we'll give priority uh, to, uh, for the first questions to be asked by our students. Please make sure your cell phones are silenced. And now uh, we will hear a formal introduction of our speakers from Giuliana Rossi. Giuliana is a fourth year student in the college studying political science and human rights. Uh, she also is the communications co-chair and a stalwart leader in the, uh, on the Student Advisory Board and in the Institute of Politics. Uh, and she's been highly engaged in the IOP throughout uh, her years at the university for which we're really grateful. Juliana. Good evening. I am so pleased to introduce Ms. Huma Abedin for a discussion about her new memoir, Both And, A Life in Many Worlds. She has held numerous incredible leadership positions throughout her life and has persevered tremendously through both personal and professional challenges. Her dedication and drive have inspired me personally as a woman seeking a role in politics and public service. Ms. Abedin has spent her entire career in public service and national politics, beginning as an intern in First Lady Hillary Clinton's office in 1996. After four years in the White House, she worked in the U.S. Senate as senior advisor to Senator Clinton and was traveling chief of staff for Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. In 2009, she was appointed deputy chief of staff at the United States Department of State. Huma served as vice chair of Hillary for America in 2016, a campaign that saw the first woman nominated for president of a major political party in the United States. She currently serves as Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. Moderating this event is Zina Rahman, who has held incredible roles in public service as well, including as the current executive director of the Institute of Politics. Previously, Ms. Rahman led the Aspen Institute's Inclusive America Project, served at the United States State Department as a special advisor to Secretaries Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, and as acting director at the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives at USAID. 
I am so pleased to welcome both of these incredible women. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Juliana. And Huma, welcome to Chicago. True to form, we have like delivered snow, <laughs> windy weather, rain, rain um, but we are so thrilled for, um, to have you here at the University of Chicago. Now, you have done 25 years of public service, um, and we talked about how that, just saying that number 25 makes us both feel pretty old. Um, but up until two weeks ago, you had never done a live interview. Um, and it feels like in the last couple weeks, you've done tons of interviews. I mean, it's probably been a blur, but we've all watched you as the book has rolled out. Um, be on TV, be on Amanpour, you know, the morning shows, all of those things. Like, I just want to know, how does that feel, and how do you prepare for that? So first of all, I did pull out my parka before I left New York, where we've had mild fall weather. And sure enough, uh, Chicago did not disappoint. Um, with the weather. I am so thrilled to be here. First of all, this building is spectacular. I'm just so excited to be in this space and this place. Juliana, thank you for that introduction. That was really wonderful and generous, and I wish you all the best. I loved chatting with you before. Um, Zena, I feel like we are sisters in many ways, and, um, and certainly in the both and world, and I'm looking forward to yeah to talking about my book and the inception. I want to thank David. I know he had to slip out, but David is so originally, and he's not here to hear this, so one of you is going to have to report this to him. I write, so this, when I did Colbert last week, he introduced the book as both and a life in many words <laughs> because it's long, and it is many words, but David's book, Believer, is longer. But he was, yes. in my epilogue, I did write about all the people, it wasn't just women, but people who had inspired me to write my story, who have these incredible stories. Um, and when I started, uh, certainly in politics and you know, 25 years ago, he was, a, was and is a legend. And so I really am thrilled, honored to be here to the entire IOP staff. Um, thank you, thank you for having me. And, and thank you all for coming and being here. I, I, um, recognize that we're still on this sort of hopefully tail end middle somewhere in the pandemic. So just being in a space and place with other people feeling this, I'm tremendously honored by the turnout and I'm really excited to be here. Yes, I never uh, did an interview before two weeks ago and um, I'm used to standing backstage and shaking and being invisible and really liking that space. But I have loved the last two weeks and sharing my story and, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about it tonight. Great, and like, you know, we're gonna talk about this both and um, hy you know, slash hyphen that you've, or not hyphen, but slash that you've decided to title the book and what that means to you and, and all of that. I also want to mention that last week this book hit the New York Times bestseller. And so as somebody, yes, yes, you deserve some applause for that. As a Muslim American, as a fellow hyphen, you know, to see somebody who's so honest in their truth, so vulnerable, hit the bestseller list. Like, I wonder if it's a first, but I was, I was, I was touched and we felt moved, I felt moved for you. Um, can you say what that was like oh when, my you, gosh. when you well, found I'm, out that you hit the Fortunately, interview? I was in the middle of an interview when I found, I, I'm so um, overwhelmed and honored and it's hard to put in words because um, I didn't expect it. And um, it was just a tremendous affirmation for the story and you know, every interview I do, so I started crying, by the way, I'm breakdown in the middle of this interview and I'm on video, which I didn't know I, I was on video. Saw that. Yeah. Um, so it was really, you know, all these years of hard work and writing, which I was telling David and Zenat about, I actually, for me, writing my story, and I say this to all young people, um, it was tremendous therapy. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed putting down um, uh, my, my life to paper and in part because uh, I did feel as though for the last 25 years of my life, uh, somebody else was telling my story and, and uh, recognized that by allowing that to happen, somebody else was writing my history. And so for me, it was reclaiming my own truth, and I did decide to just put it all down. And I really I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the process. So I want to hear about that history, and I want you to tell us about you were raised in Saudi Arabia, um, also in the United States in the summers, and born in Kalamazoo, but tell us about your early life and how that was formative in shaping your role, your roles later in public service. Well, those people who know me from public service often and, are, and, and, and know about some of the both incredible historic moments that I was privileged to walk alongside history. 
Um, and then also this insane, you cannot make this thing, these things up experiences I also had. I, for me, a, a big part of the reason I chose to start my book with my early family history is because I do think to understand somebody as an adult, um, it helps to understand where they come, came from and how they were raised. And I am a product of two immigrant parents, an Indian father, a Pakistani mother, uh, who left their countries in the 60s and came to this country as Fulbright scholars. They met at the University of Pennsylvania. They were both promised to other people. They were meant to go back after they studied. And, um, and they believed in the promise of this country and the principles, the hope, the aspirations of democracy. They, didn't, they knew it wasn't perfect, they, but they had lived through the partition. My mother was a refugee. Her family had to leave India and move to Pakistan. And you know, for me, my family uh, education really was a religion. And I start the book with my grandmother, and I end the book. Uh, frankly, with my foremothers, because, you know, as you'll read the, in the book, and I hope I hope you do read it. My father is this larger-than-life character. I mean, he, I, you know, I adored my dad, but it was my mother who was the real power behind that throne. And my grandmother um, grew up, you know, and I write the story about 110 years ago. She demanded to go to school, and it was a time when girls were not sent to public school. They weren't sent to the local school in India, and she insisted that she be sent, and so every morning the ox cart would pull to the back of the house and she would, so that people wouldn't see a girl leaving home every day. But I think about the power of choice, and obviously our leaders make choices that influence you know, millions of people, but the, the one single person's choice, and I honor every time I think about the number of times I was on Air Force One, the number of palaces I've been in, the rooms I have sat in where history is being made, I really you know, honor them. But my parents, to, to sort of fast forward, I was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where my parents were both teaching. When I was two, my father was diagnosed with renal failure, and the doctor told him he had five to 10 years and to get his affairs in order. And it's one of the first lines I wrote when I sat down to write the book, which was my father was told he was dying, and so he went out and lived. And two months later, we moved to Saudi Arabia on this sabbatical. Uh, that ended up being 42 years, a one-year sabbatical that turned into 42 years. But my parents really, from our earliest memories, Zena, they, they taught us to explore the world, explore other cultures. We traveled everywhere. We had the privilege of being able to do that growing up in that part of the world. And to me, being in spaces and places where I appreciated other cultures and languages and religions, I felt as though it prepared me perfectly for walking into the White House at 21 years old, bringing this perspective, having that grounding. My father always told me that our eyes are at the front of our head for a reason, it's to look forward, and so understanding history, but also you know, uh, informing the decisions we made in the future. And so I, to me, I, am, I do live in that both-and world. I am Indian and Pakistani. I'm an American. I can be an American patriot and also a practicing Muslim. But I have moved along the seams most of my life, and I've, I have a tremendous gratitude for having had that. I know, look, you're a beautiful embodiment of it. And um, I want to hear about why you chose, so you went to this really international school in Saudi yeah. Arabia. People yeah. think of Saudi as a closed society. Yeah. The way you describe it in the book is very different. Yeah. Um, and you ultimately made the choice to go to university in the States. Why, why, why GW, you know, how did you come over here? So I, I'm, uh, this is definitely going to date me, but back in, I remember sitting on the floor of our living room in Saudi Arabia, and there was a brand new thing called CNN International, and uh, watching on TV this woman reporting on the first Gulf War was Operation Desert Storm, and it was Christiane Amanpour, and I didn't know I could be that until I saw it. And it is one of the many, many reasons I wrote the book, is that I do think for young people, and, and I, I write... I mean, I have been flooded with notes from young Muslim girls, brown girls, just people who are, you know, f I think feeling the same way. But I had to see her to believe it was possible. In that moment, I decided I was going to be Christian Amanpour. To be Christian Amanpour meant I had to, in my mind, had to apply to school in the Uni United States. And I applied to the journalism program uh, at GW, got in, um, landed there, and had a social and cultural revolution. It was so, sh it was such a shift yeah. to like live in this country yeah. after being raised um, overseas, but that's how I ended up at GW. And then the way you describe the White House internship is that a friend told you. 
<laughs> but can you tell us about you know how you happened upon that? Yeah, and, and you know it's I, you know I was when we were talking with Juliana and a few other students earlier. I really, for me, I do feel as though so much of my life was a combination of fate, luck, and hard work, and. Um, I, I spent a lot of time both exploring different classes. You know, I took a lot of journalism classes. I took a lot of political science classes. I took crazy things that, like philosophy, I was terrible. I took creative writing. I just explored many different things, but I also joined every student's association I possibly could. And I thought that was one of the best things that I did. It was, you know, it, it led me to people I wouldn't necessarily have otherwise spent time with and opportunities. So it was my friend, Ron Neath, who I met through one of the Black Student Union you know, dinners or lunches or meetings we both attended. And one day she said to me, I have this great internship. I'm working for Mike McCurry at the White House. And you know the blue the podium that the press secretary yeah. speaks from, that blue wall? I sit behind that blue wall. And I thought, oh my god, this is how I become Christian Amanpour. <laughs> she gets me the application. I fill it out, go home to Saudi, never thinking it was possible I would get the internship I did. Yeah. Uh, except <clears throat> I didn't end up in Mike McCurry's office. I was assigned to the First Lady's office. And when you read the book, you'll understand, because of the work my mother was doing on behalf of women, my mom had gone to the Beijing conference. And, and for those of you who remember Hillary Clinton's favorite, famous speech from 1995, yep. women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights, this was one year later. They put me in Hillary Clinton's office. She's the First Lady. I step outside into the hallway, and I use my brick cell phone, and I call mom and say, I, I didn't get, I didn't get you know, the internship in the press office, and she said, you know, maybe plan A won't work out, but why don't you pursue plan B? And plan B turned out to be pretty amazing. What's funny to me is that you still saw the White House as a path to being Christiana yes, before. I did, I did. <laughs> Instead totally. of realizing you were at the White House. Um, so you've worked for- Good observation, no yeah. one's actually pointed that out, yeah. So you've worked for Hillary Clinton for 20, 20 plus years, yeah. and you've kind of gone from these roles of, you know, intern, aid, you know, from when she was first lady to then being in the Senate, Secretary of State, et cetera. I'm curious because I know we have a lot of students in the audience, like how, what is the learning curve? Like the, that's a steep learning curve. How do you learn to do the job? How did you learn to do the job? So excellent question. It was, I will tell you, everybody now, you talk to anybody uh, back in the Clinton White House, David has escaped, so he can't attest, but <laughs> everyone else like, was like, you were amazing, which I was not. It was, um, it was sink or swim. I mean, the way, you, I write in detail about um, the world of advance, which is the first job I had in the White House, and I still think that if you ever do advance, whether in government or not, it prepares you for any job um, in the world. And it really was sink or swim, and I had a lot of near misses. I write about, um, for example, the first time I flew with the President and First Lady to New York. I didn't know when the President traveled there was more than one helicopter. I just thought it was Marine One, and I was on the last helicopter and we land on the Wall Street landing zone in New York. I'm taking the luggage off with the rest of the team. My helicopter takes off. Marine One is about to land with the President and First Lady. And as the helicopter is landing, the prop wash lifts the First Lady of the United States clothes, the hanging bag, off the pier and flings it out into the East River. And I run inside, ask the staff for help, and they're like, we've never heard of this ever happening. They use a broom to fish out the suit, this sopping wet bag I throw into the back. I, we get to the hotel, and I beg them to get it dry cleaned. And she walked on stage at the United Nations the next day, having no idea that her clothes were floating in the East River the night before. We didn't tell her that for like 10 years after like I knew I had the job. I'm going to tell the story of, uh, of a time during the campaign when she was so exhausted and the White House operator couldn't wake her up and I had to like crawl into the <laughs> president and first lady's bedroom and no one had told me how you wake up the first lady of the United States. So I went shaking her and the entire house, including the leader of the free world. It was a horrible but hysterical experience. So there was a lot of learning. You know, I, I, I recount in detail all of these stories in the moment I found my voice after being scolded by the Tunisian First Lady um, when she was excluding some women from an event. I mean, I, I, I didn't really know what I was made of until I was kind of put in to the cauldron. And um, I figured out, I didn't actually think about this, but somebody who interviewed me the other day um, tells me a story which almost nobody asks me about in the book, is one of the first events was right in the middle of impeachment, very stressful time. And um, Hillary's on stage, about First Lady's on stage, she's about to give this big speech. And as they're introducing her, she does this to me. <laughs> and I'm at the back of the room. And you know, you're supposed Everybody. to be invisible as the staff yeah. person. 
I go up to the stage and she says, I don't have my speech, which was my job to put up there. And it turns out the wrong speech was in the car. And that's the moment where you're kind of like, are you going to completely collapse or figure it out? And it tests you I said to her then, which is my go-to phrase every time we have a problem, which is, I got it. Yeah. And I found the speech in the limo. And, uh, and this is, says so much about Hillary, and you know because you yeah. are in Hillary land, yeah. is that we get off stage, instead of her yelling at me saying, you've screwed this up, I'm 22, I just want to remind you. Um, she says, well, from now on, you might as well ride in the limousine with me. <laughs> and that you know, was how you get good at this job, is having that communication. Oh my God, Janelle, I'm so happy to see you. I love you so much. One of my dearest friends is here, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't have my glasses on, but I just saw her, and I'm so happy. <laughs> so, like, this idea of, you, and you said in, this, in the student session we did before, that you would, you'll outwork anybody. And I also love in the book that there's this, like, section on voice, right? When you first start yeah. Cheryl, who Cheryl is, Mills is very no-nonsense, and she's who I reported to when I worked at the State Department. I go shaking into her office every time I'd have to brief her. But she said, you're speaking too softly, speak up. Yeah. Like, how did you find your voice as a 22-year-old around these powerful women? Yeah. And what is the, like, what are Huma's superpowers? Like, is it that I'm just going to say, I'll figure it out, and I will figure it out? I, um, I do, you know, I do, there's a whole chapter in this book called Hillary Land. And I do feel as though one of the greatest advantages, or just a wonderful, um, privilege that I had was to be in an environment where women supported each other professionally, which as I have spent so much time as an adult professionally, it's not, it is not the norm. And I write that, you know, the culture in Hillary land was an uh, attitude of how do we help you? How are you feeling? You know, how's your mom? You should go see my allergist. Like this feeling of community and why is Hillary Land all of these things? Hillary Land is all of these things because Hillary Clinton is all of these things. And it was a world where as each of us climbed up the rungs of you know, uh, kind of leadership, it was not about stepping on the fingers of the women below you. It was really kind of reaching up to the lowest of us up. And I really do give credit to that you know, environment giving me the confidence to raise my voice. Zenith's right, when I first started working for Hillary, she would literally say to me, I cannot hear you. What are you saying? Because I, I really was so intimidated. I mean, imagine walking in to the, you know, the very first act I performed on behalf of my country. I was still an intern. Was they asked me to greet the first woman prime minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina. And so here I am. It's Ramadan. For those of you who know what Ramadan is, you're, I was fasting. I'm lightheaded. And this whole notion of walking down that red carpet up those marble staircases, and I was standing in the diplomatic reception room, which is the center room in the house, thinking, here I am in the center room of the center of the most powerful house in the entire world, greeting this head of state on behalf of the president and first lady of the United States. These are those goosebumpy sort of like, you, gotta, you, you have to pinch me moments. And I do think a lot of it is the training my father gave me. You know, it's a blessing and a curse. You know, I think because my father knew he didn't know how long he had, he did raise us. I mean, I was an eight-year-old, and my dad would be like, call the airlines and see if we can get from Jakarta to Bangkok. And I would shake. Or he would go out and say, you know, go talk to our guests in the living room. But I think that kind of gave me this sort of core here. I mean, I try to do that with my son. You know, it's just... You know, and I, I try to do that with my daughter too. And yeah, Zayna's got no look, problems at all. I can yeah, tell. Zayna looks from, bored. She's, yes, <laughs> but about on Hillary Clinton, who I had the honor of working with at the State Department, working for. Um, you know, it's often stated in the media, but I also felt this. Like when you meet her, when you brief her, she's warm. She's hyper prepared and knowledgeable. I mean, you know, she is well read and ready up on the issue that you're going to talk to her about. She's thoughtful. She's empathetic. Yet there's such a disconnect of who she is in the public square, yeah. and I wonder um, if you—I mean, obviously you've thought about this, but like, what is? What do you think that dissonance is about? And is there something the younger generations can kind of do to stop interrupt a cycle that I think is partly based on gender in terms of how she's perceived? Well, you know, I um, I write I do write about this in detail in the book, and there's a chapter uh, in 2016 uh, during her presidential campaign in 2016 where I tell the story of um, being sent uh, to appear as a surrogate for her, and getting up, and you know, back then I was still shaking every time I spoke, and 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 just talking, speaking from my heart. I didn't think I should do the campaign talking points. I just 
told the stories of what um, Hillary meant to me as a mentor and a friend and as a public servant. And at the end of the event, this woman comes over to me and she says, I don't understand. Why doesn't she talk about herself this way? And she, you know, this, these stories are incredible. And I said to this woman then, which is, you know, she doesn't, because she never thinks this is about her. And I grew up in the Clinton world of politics. Back in the 90s, um, you know, back then it was 24-hour cable news. So every day, cer certainly if you were, you know, working in the White House, it was all about your proactive message of the day. And you ignored everything else. So if healthcare was what you were talking about, it was healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. And as all this sort of nonsense uh, or fake news, if you will, percolated, you kind of ignored it because talking about it elevated the issue. What changed from 1996, 97, early 90s to 2016, which I frankly, um, I, I argue in the book, we learned the hard way, is we had moved far beyond 24-hour news and we were in a 24-second news cycle. So as we'd wander around and people would say, oh my God, but Hillary's dying, or, you know, there's one story, which I'm not sure it made into the book, uh, a friend of hers from Arkansas calls us, and this is during the campaign, and she calls us and says, I just left my doctor, and her medical doctor for her checkup, and her doctor said, started talking about the campaign, and Patty, the friend, said, oh, I'm supporting Hillary. And he says, I can't believe you're supporting her. You know, she's had 14 people killed. And Patty's like, what are you talking about? Right. And he says, there's a list, and I'll email it to you. And so he emails her this list. It's a totally fictitious list. And my point being, when you, when you look at the end of 2016 and you look at uh, what people believed, there's research to actually show people did believe a lot of the fake news. And so I think we can no longer, there's no longer this sort of elevated level of operating in the public sphere. You have to respond, you have to counterattack. It is one of the many reasons I wrote my book. I would read stuff about myself that was just entirely made up. Social media is not going away, yeah, it's no. not changing. Right. It's, and so for us, it's you know, being prepared to uh, counteract uh, sort of falsehoods with truth. Right. And how do we do that? I mean, so I want to go to this incident in, in 2012 where then Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, you know, rakes your, you and your family's name through the mud, right? And says that you have ties to the Muslim brother, Brotherhood. And it was widely denounced. And I was struck as I was doing the research for this that you had both Senator McCain and President Obama say these things about you. Senator McCain said, Huma represents what is best about America, the daughter of immigrants who has risen to the highest levels of our government on the basis of her substantial personal merit and her abiding commitment to the American ideals that she embodies so fully. And then we were both with the Iftar where President Obama also said about you, um, that includes a good friend, Huma Abedin, who's worked tireless, tirelessly in the White House, Senate, State Department, where she's been nothing less than extraordinary in representing our country and the democratic values that we hold dear. The American people owe her a debt of gratitude because Homa is an American patriot and an example of what we need in this country. More public servants with her sense of decency, her grace, and her generosity of spirit. So on behalf of all Americans, we, we thank you so much. Um, can you talk about that time period? And then if you think like you would get that same kind of vocal support today in kind of today's political climate from both sides of the aisle? You know, I, I argue in the book uh, and I've talked about this, uh, that 2012 accusation that um, then Congresswoman Michelle Bachman and five of her colleagues um, in the House made was, and if you know anything about my public life, I've been through a lot, probably was the worst moment. And in part because um, they attacked the integrity of my parents and, right. uh, and my father was no, not even alive to defend himself. And so for me, I'd been in politics long enough, but for them, um, it was so shocking. And when you come from my part of the world, your name and reputation is, um, is everything. And the minute it is you know, questioned, it's, um, it's, it's devastating. And especially when it was the exact opposite of who they were. My father's entire life was um, informed by and, and Zina, you know, you would have loved my dad. I mean, this notion of exploring Muslim minority conditions around the world, he was prescient about so many things, about Bosnia, about yeah. the Rohingyas in Myanmar, the Uyghurs in China. And essentially his argument was, if we don't figure out how to live in this world where we're no longer in the Ottoman Empire and masters of our universe, we're gonna have problems. And um, so to say, to be that person criticized, he was criticized by fellow Muslims who would say, why do you go into having these conversations with the other? 
Why do you go into having these conversations where even, even angels fear to tread? Because my father was about reaching out to the other side. And that is why it was so painful. Um, and it wasn't just me. There were several very high-ranking, enormously respected Muslims in government who were attacked. But we were the appetizer. I mean, that is, I mean, in 2012, this notion of Muslims in America, or just Muslims generally, being this sort of scary, we were made the other. And, um, and, and these horrific acts of terrorism, and certainly culminating in 9-11, cast a shadow uh, on all of us. And it had ramifications. I mean, we got on a plane, went to Egypt. Hillary was Secretary of State, and a man sat across from her weeks after this accusation, this completely false accusation. And he said, we're not sure we trust your government. This Egyptian, this delegation member said, we're not sure we trust your government because this woman is your advisor. And of course, Hillary, in typical Hillary form, is like, oh, you mean Huma? She's right over here. You should talk to her. <laughs> and I did, um, and I stayed in touch with him. And what Senator McCain and President Obama did, which is so humbling and so incredible, and I, I was so grateful to them, but they weren't, it wasn't just about me and my family. It was standing up for American principles and values. This is not who we are as Americans, and it was not OK. And then fast forward to 2016, and you can see and beyond. Like This is you know, something, I'm sorry, but Donald Trump did turn us into an other. We are the other along with anybody else who isn't in his very you know, small group of uh, you know, supporters as, uh, as and, and it's a divided country. I mean, it's not that. Uh, so uh, we were the Muslims were the canary in the coal mine or the early warning signal, but how do we, and now we're, we just have depolarization in our country. Like, how do we get out of that? Well, I talk about um, in 2008 when Hillary ran for president um, at the first time. I know some people don't even remember. I don't even know in Chicago. Like people just remember Obama and McCain. But there are people, when I wrote my book and I submitted it to my publishing house, a few of the young women said, I had no memory that Hillary ran for president in 2008. It's like, you know, Obama and McCain, which was, you guys remember? Thank you. Um, Thank Because they're University of Chicago students. That's why they remember. <laughs> Um, but there, there are people you know, who don't. And I remember at the beginning of the campaign, having an early campaign meeting, and somebody from the campaign saying, listen, we have to figure out how to get more diversity on the road. And I remember raising my hand saying, wait, what about me? And she said, and she was right, she said, you don't count. And what she meant was back in 2008, I mean, this demographic, this group of people, was not participating, Asians generally, certainly not Muslims, the Arab community, was not participating in elections that made a difference in uh, pretty much, actually, anywhere. Maybe Michigan, maybe, but not really. They just weren't engaged. Fast forward to 2016, when you look at um, uh, studies and research, Asians and Arabs voted in key states, including Arizona, including Michigan, in big enough margins that it made a difference for Biden. Biden carried Arizona, as those of you know. That, so to me, it is all about representation. It is about, all about stepping up and you know, using our voices. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book, which is let, let, is, let us get out there and, and show, show what it's like. This whole book, I really try not to tell stories. I just show you what it's like. I take you on that airplane. I take you to Iraq in the middle of the war as we talk to women. I take you to Buckingham Palace and show, reveal the humanity, I hope, of people like Bill and Hillary Clinton, of Barack and Michelle Obama, of John and McCain and Lindsey Graham. And it's just a taste of what that life is like. And I hope I've, you know, I hope I've done a worthy job. I think you have. And I, I mean, plug for the book, but everybody should read the book. It's, a be it's beautifully written. I think one thing you do show us, and I think a through line through kind of all of these tremendous experiences you've had, good and bad, yeah. is how much your faith has meant to you and how it's guided you in your decision making. Um, and I want to know, like, how has it made you a better public servant? Well, I, you know, for me, just having that core that, I mean, essentially, uh, first of all, I've loved talking to my non-Muslim friends since the book came out, and people are like, I don't understand. You believe in Jesus? You believe in Moses? It's like, <laughs> yep, we, you know, the sort of commonalities, I, I think the average American isn't um, uh, familiar with um, that intersection of the, the three monotheistic faiths and, like, how, you know, uh, close it is. Uh, for me, I'm... Uh, I'm lucky that I had it as my core. And Muslim prayer, essentially, 
is a meditation. It's just stepping back from the world and reflecting on your deeds and your intentions. I mean, that's what it is. And, um, and my faith, to some extent, saved me. As you read the book, uh, I mean, I went through a, uh, to a pretty dark place, particularly after the 2016 election, when I felt very isolated. I you know, carried a lot of guilt um, and responsibility uh, for Hillary's loss. And I, I really needed my faith to, to bring me back. And actually, the story I end the, you know, close to the end of the book, I talk about my father going back in 2018 and taking my little boy to Mecca, which is the most, the holiest place yeah. in Islam. And my, my house, um, uh, as you'll read, is Miss Havisham's house from Great Expectations. My mom doesn't throw out anything. <laughs> but in all our parents. Oh my thought? God, yeah. it's crazy. And so in 2018, I went and cleaned out my dad's closet, which had been sitting untouched for all these years. And I found um, uh, in all of his undershirts that they were, um, they were all stained with blood in the back because he'd had so many surgeries and so many procedures and dialysis for two years. But to me, I thought, here was my dad. He was always smiling. He was so optimistic. He was perfectly dressed. The notion of you know, having that outlook on life when you are dealing with so much pain, like, honestly, to me, was his le final lesson to me 26 years later that you can fi find hope and joy and promise despite the pain, and, uh, and that's, that's my faith that took me there. That's beautiful. Um, I think it was hard to read about you reliving, the or me reliving like my experience of the 2016 yeah. election, um, and, and, and all of the painful things you went through around that time and, and during that election. Um, and I, I do wanna ask about this like discovery on your ex-husband's computers, a computer of, of State Department emails, right? This email thing that was, that, um, triggered a new investigation two weeks before the election. And I mean, as you have a young child, you're trying to deal with you know, the dissolution of your marriage and then a presidential campaign. Like, can you talk about what you went through at that, at that time? Well, I, um, I note uh, in the book and in every interview, because I've been asked in any interview, that what was done, that announcement 11 days before the election was completely unprecedented, the FBI investigation reopening um, the email yep. uh, investigation into Hillary. And then for two days before the election to say, we've actually looked at everything and there's nothing here. Um, these are all duplicates. The, the trauma and the stress that I went through in that moment, and I do write the scene in the book, I mean, to be honest, I was so, it was in such shock that I couldn't feel anything because at that point feeling for myself felt selfish. It was all about November 8th. We all, it was all about getting you know, Hillary to election day and through it, and we were all kind of banded together. But I knew it was a big thing. You know, an election this small, as Janelle knows, every little thing makes a difference, and this was a big, big thing. Um, and uh, I, um, I'll, you know, when the, when the campaign started, I write the story in the book. When the campaign started, I, I was sitting in Hillary's office, and I saw an article, there were several articles about this email investigation being opened for the first time. So this is spring of 2015. And in the article, it says several of um, Hillary's uh, senior aides and, and mentioned me have been asked to provide material, have asked to cooperate. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, no one's asked me to provide anything. No one's contacted me. No one's asked me to do anything. So I'm that person who marches down to her office, call my lawyer friend saying, how can I be helpful? I don't know anything about this aside from what I'm reading in the paper. And so to me, it was the added, it added to this level of sort of shock and the why, 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 because of course I would have cooperated. Of course I would have said, look at anything before you know, they made this huge announcement. And on top of that, which I think people forget, they were, now we know, but they were investigating other <clears throat> campaigns. Other, there were other things being investigated right. that they chose to keep private. So in 2016, when we were wandering around talking about a foreign country intervening in this election and the, the fake ads on, on Facebook, people thought we were crazy. I mean, literally looked at us like we were crazy, and now you know, it's established fact. It was horrible, is a summary. <laughs> For all of us. Um, and then you're like dealing at this with this at the same time as like, you know, you're dealing also with the, um, your marriage that was dissolving in a painful personal scandal. And I don't, that's not the story of this book. It's a story about you and I don't wanna talk about that, but you do talk a lot about 
shame yeah. and how you felt shame. And my initial reaction was like, you didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Like, what do you feel shameful about? Yeah. But there is something in our culture, in South Asian culture, we have this thing of like, what will people say, yeah. right? Yeah. And we hear so much about what other people think and what other people will say. Um, and I wonder, and I think in general, like grace and forgiveness is just not something in our broader culture that, that, is, that is rewarded. And so what, you know, like what? Yeah, I, I do, you, you know, it is one of the reasons I chose when I was uh, starting to write this book, my researcher um, came up to me and she says, you know, we've been searching all the articles about you from that period of time and like the most common headlines are what is wrong with her and what is she thinking? And it is why I chose to write in the book exactly what I was thinking because I do believe what I went through um, in my personal life actually, unfortunately, is not sort of singular to me. I just think I had to do it on the front page of the newspaper. And, um, and I, in every instance, tried to make what I thought was the right choice for me and my family, mostly my child. I was not even 12 weeks pregnant um, the first time my entire you know, world exploded. And I also think, and I do have two chapters in the book. One is called Shame, Shame, Go Away, and the other is Elephant in the Room. Yeah. And, um, and I'm not even sure if this is necessarily like a South Asian thing. I think women, we just do this to ourselves. Like we take responsibility. We, you know, we feel, I mean, I write in, 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 I write about, you know, how society, you know, really kind of shunned Anthony and I and how hard it was, how hard it was to not know where you were welcome we, we would volunteer at a food bank and they asked us to no longer come back. You just didn't know your space and place in the world. And that does something to you. It does something um, to your sense of self-worth and, 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 um, and to your identity. And um, I think one of the lessons I am hoping people take away from this book is that it's okay to not be okay because mental health, um, I didn't understand what I was going through for so long. And, um, and I, I came from a family where you didn't, you know, you, even though there was lots of like hugs and I love yous, you didn't talk to strangers. I mean, therapy was not something we did in my household growing up. You didn't talk to strangers about your problems. But I, in the end, needed to. I, 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 did, get, um, I did get professional help. But I, it's why I came forward. And, and maybe because I'm in Chicago and no one's really asked me this, but I, I actually write um, a lot about how, especially President Obama, really carried me through uh, a lot. I was, at, I was at the State Department at this time. And I mean, I was going through so much like external trauma. Like I was that person that when I walked in the room, like people would get quiet or everyone would look away or you know, people would just pretend not to look in my belly. And he, every single time I went to the White House or we were on the road, he treated me with so much respect, so much, you know, well, what do you think? never made me feel like the elephant in the room. And I, you know, I, I write how much gratitude I have for him for his kindness and his, his you know, sense of decency and generosity. I mean, I think it just shows you too, I mean, we know this already, but you never know what's going on in someone's yes. life. I mean, yes. in, in, in your case, unfortunately, like people read into what they thought was going on right, in your life, right. but you don't know. You don't know what that person's dealing with at any, any given moment. Um, you also have you, these, you have these two strong female role models in your book that are that are through lines. Your mom, and early in the book, you write that you know she had a full flight, full time career. Yeah. She sewed your clothes. Yeah, what? yeah, and cooked fresh meals every day. Yeah, mom was definitely super mom. Um, mom so she, was did it all. she did it all. <laughs> she did it all. She did it all. And in the book, I actually have like a picture of the outfits <laughs> she very sewed cute. for me and my sisters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and then you have Hillary Clinton, right? Who will outwork anybody as well. I mean, she's one of the most hardworking people I've ever observed. Um, what lessons do you learn from that generation of women? And then what lessons do you think our generation has for younger women today? You know, I, my mom called me uh, in the spring of 95 saying, I'm going to Beijing this fall for a conference on women. And would you come with me to the New York? There was a pre-conference, the UN in New York. And here I am thinking, I mean, don't women have everything? Like, what are you talking about? You guys fought, you know, your generation fought for equal rights and equal pay and all these things. I think about how naive I was at that point. I, I just figured I could do whatever I wanted, be whatever I wanted. In part, it was how I was raised. I did not know how challenging it still was for women. And when we were in the White House, we just did whatever. We didn't, you know, I write about how we would share hotel rooms on the road. We all shared offices. You, we didn't even think we were entitled um, to more. So it wasn't until 2000 and then 2008 where I saw the role sexism played. I certainly believe it played a role in Hillary's loss in 2008, um, even though 
I mean, David and I were talking about this before we came out. I mean, it was such a hard primary because here you had these two extraordinary candidates and it sucked running against Senator Obama because <laughs> they agreed on 90% of the issues. I mean, he was a phenomenal candidate. The teams, they, the teams knew each other. But, you know, the reason I'm so surprised when, when young people say they don't even know she ran for president in 2008, she made history for women and girls in this country forever. You know, she was the first woman to win a, a primary, and no one has been able to do what she's done since then. And that says a lot. It's 2021, right. and nobody, forget the 59, 60 states and the caucuses and primaries she's won since then. If that doesn't show you how hard it is you know, for women in the workplace, um, I don't know what does, but it is why I double down on this notion that it is so important to show up, stand up, and, and, and that's why. I try to look at the silver linings, and the silver lining I have from her 2016 loss is, is, the, is the movement of women nationally saying, enough is enough. I'm not you know, going to take this. I'm not going to be silent anymore. And I think it's long overdue, and I'm, I applaud all the young women, and women, rather, who've run for office since then. I, I was interested as I was reading the book or in thinking about this idea of, like, you have a principal, right, and, or somebody that you report to, and that's... For you, that was Hillary Clinton, who was in the public face, you know, in the public square, and she's the one doing the speeches. But that female leadership comes in different forms, yeah. right? And yeah. I think you embody such a powerful form of leadership, which is behind the scenes. And, and you said you preferred that, and I kind of understood why, because yeah. I think, especially in policymaking, so much work gets done that way. Um, and so, I don't know. I'm just like, what is what? How do you, as you think about that? And now you're a public figure, yeah. and yeah. you know, obviously, I'm going to ask you what you're going to do next, but. What does your experience say about different modes of female leadership? How have you thought about that as we give advice to you know, new generations up and coming about what leadership is and what female leadership is? Well, you know, I think um, one of the things, uh, and Hillary talks about this a lot, and I, it's one of the messages I write in my book often, which is to do, you know, I tell all young women to do the thing that scares you the most. Uh, it's probably worth it, and that's what I'm doing. I'm doing the thing that scares me the most, which is speaking in public and telling my story. And I've been lucky to have, uh, you know, professional women, professionally, people like you, people like Hillary. You knew, you are, you were, you're all in this together. Not everyone has that work environment. So even finding that one person, that one mentor, who's going to help you um, kind of find your way and find that path, I think is, is so important. Um, and whether it's public voices or private voices, and I agree with you. I think a, a watch, you know, for me, I loved being part of the sausage being made. Mm -hmm. And I tell the stories of what it was like in all the planning meetings before we get to the decision. And then we send Hillary out there to make the public speech or President Obama or whoever, you. Um, and I liked, I liked being behind the scenes. And you, you, there were different, I think also in part, it's helpful to have somebody you can identify. Like I always think Hillary believed in me more than I believed in myself. Um, and it, I was lucky to have that. And I try to do that for younger you know, women and men. You're just younger people in our office saying, you can do this. Um, uh, you know, I, I, one of my favorite stories from the book, he hates it. But it was this intern when we were in the Senate, this intern uh, who wrote up, uh, there used to be intra between Senate offices baseball games. And he wrote a write up of like some baseball game. And Hillary reads it. And she says, this, this intern's really good. He should write more. And we're all kind of rolled our eyes. We're like, OK, fine, Dan. Write some more stuff. Dan <laughs> went on to write two of Hillary's books with her, number one New York Times bestsellers. But my point is, I'm not sure Dan saw that in himself. She did. And, and to have that, you're lucky to have that person in your life. And for me, it's fi just finding that one person if you can. Yeah, that's great advice. Do you have other advice for an audience of students who are passionate about public service? might not know their you know, next step or step after that or step after that. Well, we talked about this a little bit beforehand. I mean, you're going to win some and lose some. And the winning is extraordinary. The losing sucks. But it's worth it. I mean, I, um, I'll, never, I mean I'll never forget still those moments. Those moments, the, the sound, Janelle knows the sound, the pounding of the floors in the gym, the, the, the extraordinary responsibility you feel when you walk down a rope line and somebody tells you about their fears, their hopes, what they want and what they need. I mean, I take that as such a responsibility. And, and the possibilities when you're in public service and when you win, you can help these people. There's nothing uh, like that. But one of the pieces of advice I did not take uh, that my father gave me when I was growing up, which is uh, a good life is a balanced life. I did not have a balanced life. My work was my job. That's all I did. 
uh, and I rarely saw my family. I, you know, I, I write, there's a whole chapter in the book, it's called Calling White House Signal and Being at a Family Wedding and Getting a Call to Go to Argentina. And I went to Argentina, and every single time I took the, I took that call. And as a result, you know, didn't get to spend as much time with my family until I was forced to. Actually, Hillary reminded me to. And I'm glad I did. I'm, I'm, I have a much more balanced life now. There's this um, uh, great pioneer Muslim American civic leader who, whose name is Maher Hatout, and um, he's oh, passed yeah. away. And he says he has this beautiful line, which is, home is not where my grandparents are buried, but where my grandchildren will be raised. Yes, yes. And I want you to talk about what you hope your legacy will. You write about your history so beautifully in this book. What do you hope the legacy of of Huma Abedin is 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now? Uh, wow, I feel so presumptuous about legacy. <laughs> I mean, I really, more than anything, uh, I, for me, and uh, I think so much less about myself and it's more about, it really is about honoring the past. I want my, you know, it, uh, I always believe my dad thought I was gonna be a writer and I tell the story, I've told the story, Zenit knows the story that my dad gave me Silas Marner when I was 10 and I didn't understand the content, it was above my head, and I read the introduction and saw that George Eliot was actually Marianne Evans, and I went to my father and said, why did she use a man's name? And he said, in the Victorian era, women were not taken seriously as writers, um, but don't worry, um, when you grow up um, and you write your book, you'll use your own name and everyone will take it seriously. And so for me, I, this whole book ultimately is really a love letter to my dad that I hope if I could have a conversation with him, I could say, this is what I did, and I hope you're proud of me. And I hope when my son, Jordan Zane, um, turns, named after my dad, um, is old enough to read the book, that he'll look at it and say, I'm proud of my mommy, and you know, and it inspires him to use his life and find purpose um, for the greater good. Look, um, he will be proud of you, and we all are proud of you. And especially for those of us who see ourselves in this writing, where your dad would be grateful, but so are we. So thank, thank you, Huma, for writing the book. We're gonna go to Q&A from all of you. There's a microphone there, and there's a microphone there. You can just queue up and, um, and ask your questions. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Huma, it's Daniel. <laughs> so happy to see you. Last Likewise. time we were together was in Paris. I know. We should go back soon on your book tour. I would love it. But because we're in the IOP, I had a quick question. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Sorry. Saw somebody say I had a quick question related to politics. Yes. Uh, Senator Leahy announced he's retiring today. Oh, so I didn't see if you would that. Pull a, that would you consider pulling a baby boom and moving to Vermont to run for Senate? <laughs> Oh, Daniel. Now, I could turn that question around and ask you that question. I have no plans, even though I've stolen from Shonda Rhimes that this is my year of saying yes. That's what Shonda said when she wrote her memoir. Um, I think it's yes, but I can't, I don't see myself running for office. Sorry, mm -hmm. Daniel, to disappoint you. No. Oh. Really? You should think about it. Run. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're on my team, Daniel, I think anything's We're all possible. On your team. Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Hamza. I'm a second year in the college. Hi, um, I grew up in Dubai since I moved there when I was five from DC um, and lived there until uh, moving here for college. And I also am interested in a, a career in public service. And I just wanted to ask, uh, to what extent was like living, like spending your childhood, like your entire childhood outside of the US an advantage or a disadvantage when you went into public service in the US? So disadvantage I'll do first. I mean, there were definitely cultural things I didn't understand um, that uh, I can't think of many things right now, but there were definitely like things people would say. I would say 90% of it was an advantage. It was having a different perspective. When you read the book, you'll see, I mean, it's the, when I joined the White House, we, the United States was the sole superpower in the world. A lot has changed since then. Look where we are now. And so having the being able to be in the both and, I mean, I write the stories of going to Iraq, talking to women, um, going to a Macedonian refugee camp and being able to relate to that part of the world, understanding the complexities, the dichotomy. I think one of the biggest lessons, in my opinion, my personal opinion, that we've learned in Afghanistan leaving after all this time and the, you know, the government collapsing is 
we can't assume that other countries are going to want to have a democracy just like ours. Yeah. It's, it's so much more complex um, uh, than is uh, obvious uh, to, the, you know, uh, to the average person. And so I would say you have a great advantage, and I wish you luck. Please. Hi, uh, hi. I'm Zara Zahid, and uh, thank you so much for coming here. I'm thank from you. Pakistan. I'm here as an MPP student in Harris School of Public Policy. I'm also a public servant back home, and I'm here on Fulbright scholarship. Oh so there's gosh. a lot of commonality. <laughs> you and my mom. I gotta tell her. Yeah, uh, my question is about being a public servant because, right, you, like you mentioned, that you have this regret that you did not have a balanced life. So whenever it's women coming out and working in spaces like that, they always carry this regret that we were not able to give a lot of time to our family. Whereas men don't have that. They actually put in maybe as many hours or less than that, but they don't have that regret when they retire. So uh, how do we cope about it? Because we, I'm just starting my career and you're also in the mid-level, so I want to know how to go about it. Great Thank question. you. It's a great yeah. question, and I wish I had an easy answer. It is not easy. I mean, it is even on days, you know, I happen to have a partner who is fully involved in you know, raising our child and doing the balance, and it was still hard. And in part, one piece of advice I would give you is don't carry the guilt. I mean, I. You know, I, I tell the story in the book when I would leave my little boy, he was four, and he would say, Mommy, when you, why are you going? And when are you coming back? I, I had to balance knowing that I was going out and doing, trying to create a world that I thought would be better for him to live in. Um, I do think, um, personally, this is my personal opinion, I, I think that men have to be part of the solution. Uh, I've so, inherited this from my mother. My mother... I write about going to that pre-conference in New York uh, in April of 1995, but the Aberdeen who she took to Beijing was my brother. And um, she told it, when she came back, she told us the story of uh, women at the conference trying to get into uh, the speech for Hillary. Um, and there was all this jostling outside, and my brother is trying to get in with my mother. He's like 23. And this woman turns to my brother, and she puts her finger in his chest and says, you know, this is a conference for us, not you. And my mother stood in front of my brother and said, it is just as important for my son to understand how to respect and honor the roles and responsibilities and the equality of women it is for my daughters. And so he has to see this. And so to me, yes. going back to what Zenit was saying, it is, I'm trying to raise my son. I, I end my book with this, not only, you know, because I do talk about Kamala Harris, obviously, um, it's amazing for us to be aspirational. It's amazing for you to, and I wish you all the best. And you know, if I ask my mother, a Pakistani woman on a Fulbright who's a public servant, you are going to be a star, no question. But I think society, it is you need men at the table and you need men invested or nothing's going to change. Fully agree. Sorry, I'm a bit short, so this may not be great. <laughs> um, but um, hi, I'm Divya Marotra, so I was actually speaking to you a bit earlier. Um, I am a first year undergraduate at the college, and I am born to two Indian um, immigrant parents. And um, I think your discussion about this idea of like shame, um, it's a phrase that I think a lot of Indian families use, lokya mm -hmm. um, is I think sparked just a really interesting you know, thought for me where you talk about how your reputation was threatened um, in 2012, but then you also, with this statement, lo kya kenge, what will people think, is you're responsible for protecting your reputation, but just in a way that your family or the people around you dictate um, of how to do so. So how do you protect your reputation in situations like 2012, but just on your own terms? I am, um, you know, wow. Well, um, I think it's having... I do think age had something to do with it. I do, there is a chapter that says, what would, pe that is, what would people say? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think part of its age, as I think, as I got older, as I have gotten older, uh, this is a story that got cut from the book, but when I was turning 40, I had all kinds of you know, challenges with turning 40. I thought it was like the end of the world at the time, at the time. But actually, in hindsight, I, so they tell a story of this book where this woman who's in her 40s comes and says, this is gonna be your best decade. Because there's something about reaching that age where you get that you know, confidence in yourself and you know, who you are. Um, I'm not saying it was easy. It was really, really hard. And it is one of the reasons I, um, 
I don't know why this is coming to me, but I was in Los Angeles on Friday. I was in, on the West Coast all last week, and I ended up doing an event with the South Asian community uh, at this community center. Uh, uh, and I did, it was a book signing. And I was stunned by the number of families that came by with their little girls and fathers saying to me, tell her she can do whatever she wants. Tell her your story. And so I think part of it is, is just creating this community where you do feel that support. But it isn't, it isn't something that's easy. Just know you have it in you somewhere. You just have to find it. Thank you. Thank did you. your family? Your, sub, your siblings, your mom, like also have to evolve kind of as, you know, you went through this really th personal thing and they did as well. Yeah. They're, how much they cared about what, you know. Yeah, it's hard. These are hard things to talk about with your family sometimes. I mean, it's why there are advantages to therapy. Um, mm. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, when it's the people who love you the most, they feel the most helpless, right? Yeah. Because they want to help you, but they don't know what to do. Uh, so for me, it was it was it was getting it was getting professional help. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a first year student in the college, and I've worked on communications for my congressman and my governor. So that's kind of what the framing is for this question. Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier for women working in politics, and how do you advise us to kind of break down that barrier? I think it's changing slowly, but it is changing. Um, I, I, uh, I share the stories in 2008. We didn't know how to deal with sex, sexism in politics. Uh, I, even as I was writing the stories, I was stunned that people, when people would make comments to Hillary, even though she was at this debate stage, um, she was at this debate stage uh, with all these men, and people would say, oh, your voice is annoying, or I don't like your jacket, or you're likable enough, like all these things that we would just laugh. We would giggle nervously. So Tucker Carlson could go on TV and say, when Hillary comes on, uh, I just I involuntarily cross my legs. And we all laughed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the famous story of Hillary breaking down, crying in New Hampshire, even in that moment, this moment of her kind of un, kind of leeching of herself, she jokes about the fact that she's exhausted and she has to wake up early to get her hair and makeup done. I don't believe as a society, men, women, anybody knew how to deal with um, these comments about women. We just assumed it was the price we paid to be in the game. And in 2016, I write about the co epic comic levels we went to at the highest level to say, to. To, to judge Hillary. People would say, her jackets are too long. Her jackets are too short. You should put her in t-shirts so she's more approachable. And then I would go to California and people would say, oh, don't put her in these t-shirts. She looks like a soccer mom. She's got to look presidential. Nobody could agree on what she looked like. And I, I, I share the story of a conversation I had with a, a Hollywood director who said, I want to give you advice on how to, you know, Hillary should present herself. I said, OK, do you have any ideas, any models for her to follow? And they said, great, her husband. Uh. Okay, <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> President Obama, excellent. They're both extraordinary communicators. They're also men. When I asked him, who is a woman that you think Hillary should talk like or act like? I didn't think of one. And they couldn't think of anybody. And my, for her, at least in politics, there was no model because she is the model for so many other, other people. And then my favorite story was a media advisor telling me that she always looks so mad when she's giving her speeches. So we had a solution, and the solution was I should take a picture of her grandchild and put it on the podium. And so every time she would go to the podium, she would look at something that made her happy. And so she would be happy. And it was like these, it was, it was impossible. Um, but, I, but I think we have a lot of work to do. I mean, I wish I could say it's all like roses and buttercups now. It's not. It really isn't. I think. If anything, in 2020, it showed that it wasn't easier for women. And uh, it's baby steps. So we had this enormous, I'm a Democrat, so I, it was 2018 was a, an amazing year. And 2020 was a, a sort of an amazing year, women standing up for themselves, saying enough is enough, and I'm going to participate. And, uh, and it was great. But, but even today, I mean, men still hold, men still hold the seats of power. Politics, business, any industry you talk about, men are at the top. And, the only way forward is for women like you yeah. to step up and get in the arena. Do you think our consciousness around calling this out is changing because of Me Too? I do. I mean, I don't, I'm not really going to do sort of armchair, like, expert, you know, th thinking here. But I, I, I do think 
that it, it is, you know, it's a, to me, it's a generational thing. It's how we raise our boys. Yeah. Right. Hi, my name is Uzumaka Inezwa. I am a second year MPP student here at the Harris School. Um, my question is more on the personal side. Um, I am first gen Nigerian American, so I know the pressure, the cultural pressures um, and the parental pressures that our parents um, set on us, whether that's subconsciously or um, unconsciously in terms of what their hopes and dreams are for us. So I wanted to know, if you could go back um, and talk to your younger self, what would you say to yourself? What would you advise yourself? Um, especially because you know you had the idea or the dream um, to be Christiana Amapur and it didn't happen. So uh, <laughs> kind of just talk to the, that effect. Well, first of all, when you read the book, you'll see one of my best friends growing up, Fatima, was Nigerian. And she's like, I, I have stories. I mean, this is the thing about having those amazing friendships. I talk about visiting her when we were at the State Department back in Nigeria. I think for me, it is what I said earlier, is this notion that, you know, do what scares you. Don't assume it has to be X, Y, or Z. F follow your heart. If you love doing something, try it. You know, it might, it might actually work out. I think we kind of build these boxes for ourselves and say it has to be these things. And I have to tell you something, and I don't know you, like I, your parents will be proud of you, your family is gonna be proud of you. In the end, that's the one, after everything, I think my family is here, I don't have my glasses on, but my cousin is here, he's right there, a Like we are, we, my family is this large South Asian crazy family and we don't see each other for long periods of time. But to, they love you and they're there for you, whether you see them or not, don't see them very often. You are the only person, to the point Zenith makes, you're the only person who has to go back to that dorm, go back to that apartment, go back to that marriage, that relationship, whatever you choose to do. So can you live with yourself? And sometimes that's a hard, that's a hard thing to answer. But um, just find, you know, you're going to be OK. Thanks. Your family will always love you. Uh, your family will always <laughs> love you. See, I've got my back up here. <laughs> Well, because we're maybe because we're in Chicago and at David Axelrod's Institute of Politics, I want to end with just asking you, what gives you hope? Well, looking at Zaina, looking yeah. at all my nieces here, I, I, the sen the feeling of, you know, I acknowledge, which a lot of people are shocked who haven't read it, and I know most of you haven't read the book, but a lot of people are shocked that I, um, I, I uh, thank my ex-husband in the book, and people are just stunned, like after everything he's put you through, and I do because. He gave me my son. Yeah. And how can you not be grateful for that? Because it is, I, I don't, I'm really not really good at social media, but I've been on the road for two weeks and my son who's nine turning 10, I mean, he could care less. Like he gets excited if I told him I'm doing a TikTok video. When he sees the video, the camera's <laughs> coming in, he's like, what is this? An interview is like, I could care less because it's all about him, which I get. But I was on the road for two weeks and I came, I returned home on Saturday and I walked in, uh, I opened the door and there was this big poster written by my son in his handwriting, and it says, Mom, you are both a great writer and a good mom. I love you. Aww. And I was like, this, in the end, is always going to be the best part of my day. Yeah. And I'm so lucky to, I'm so grateful that I have him. I'm so lucky to have him. So it's, that's what it, that's in the end what's, what it's about, the most important thing. To my team, I heard, what I heard is that she wants to do a TikTok before she leaves. Um, <laughs> also, I just want to say, as somebody who knows you but not very well, um, to watch somebody kind of come into their own voice and just shine and see the world receive it is so special. And like, thank you for coming to Chicago in cold, snowy Midwest and so spending time with us. And I really hope all of you will read the book, buy the book, listen to the book. She narrates the the audiobook because I I just really enjoyed it and I think every one of us will far, find a piece of ourselves in your story um, and that will hopefully be instructive for how we want to be in the world no matter what age we are so thank you Huma thank you thank, thank you, you all thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.